everybody. Today we are showing featured entries from the October Art Dare, and we are also introducing the December Art Dare. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need our art prof, critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. The first artist we have is Paula V. Fernandez, and Paula has a piece called Halloween Harvest, stop motion animation painting, and was influenced by Deep D's process of doing basically the animated film on one sheet of paper. And so classic fall harvest crops, morphing an apple, parsnip, carrot, pumpkin, and Paula says, turned out to be a lot of fun. Definitely going to do more animated paintings in the future. Well, we're going to show the clip in a little bit, but isn't this fun that this is the animated film? Yeah, no, I, this is super fun. And one of the th this actually reminds me of a uh, project we would do in animation class in school, and it was called Metamorphosis. And you would just have to start with one frame of something and just change it as time went on. So this gives me those good old vibes of, of metamorphosizing animation stuff. I just love so much how there's so much packed into this animated film because we have so many subjects and it's like they all match like the parsnip to the carrots and then the apple it's just like so well chosen yeah. all of the various objects and they also fit perfectly into the hall far harvest theme and also jordan one thing i do like about this piece as well is if you look back here let's take a look at the page again the changes are not that dramatic but you just feel like a lot happens in a short clip yeah i mean that's kind of how things tend to work it's like you you put in the little uh changes and over time eventually you see a big difference right like you know you've heard the expression rome wasn't built in a day it was and there's there's truth in that you know art pieces aren't usually built quickly it's the small little individual steps and then you see the end and suddenly just different in whatever way that is tell us in the chat if any of you have done animation i've only done it when deep d is there to hold my hand through every single second and it's it's really fun i think the way that deep d makes it so simple and accessible all right, the next artist is, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Siki Lee. And in their statement, they say watercolor is a brand new media, looking at those gourds at their local grocery. Siki explains they're almost arbitrary shapes, corrugated surfaces, mix of colored patterns. I wanted to use watercolor to capture the dynamic play following through each furrow and bulge on the gourds was a meditative and mind freeing process. I don't know about you, Jordan, but I love it when the gourds come out <laughs> at the grocery stores. I I know nothing about gourds. I probably learned what they were from art, art school or something like that and still lives. Um, but, <laughs> but this came out really, really cool. I love, especially in that last one, the color complements with the blue gourd and the orangish uh, background, that, that pop right there is really, really nice. Um, and just how uh, how much texture you're able to get and how you're able to really feel the forms wrapping around um, on each of these feels really, really nice. What I think is weird about gourds is that none of them look the same. There's always one with a weird pimple or some strange bulge somewhere. And mm -hmm. so I really do think about them as individual people that have very distinct personalities. And so the paintings are like that too. This one feels sort of funky and it's hanging out. And this one is just this like cascade of gourd warts. It, it's just really fun because it's all gourds, but the paintings have such different qualities. Yeah, no, I think that's that's what makes this subject so perfect is because you can't possibly interpret to, uh, the same gourd the same way each and every uh, time you paint it. Like, like I remember uh, an old documentary from Disney and they had four artists paint a tree from different angles and they all had different styles and it would just come out completely unique each time. And that's how I feel here. You have one artist painting multiple gourds and they all have a very different feeling. Manette says, these are some cool textures. 
Cedric says, nice work. 7A says, lovely. The colors have such a range. I like this one because he's almost tipping over. There's this precarious feeling of gravity in this one that I think is really, really fun. And everybody keep those comments coming because a lot of the artists are here live or they'll watch the replay. We obviously can't get to every single comment, but it's so nice to have the chatter going on in the feed. Okay, the next artist is Amber, again, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Vizcara. And Amber did all different kinds of pieces. So we're looking at this pumpkin now. <clears throat> and Amber was researching Gaelic traditions and death and decay and all of these various symbols from these stories and also made a 50s housewife pumpkin. So I'm just gonna show you guys the images so you can see what we're looking at. And Jordan, isn't it cool that Amber shared all of their notes and things? Oh yeah, that's one of the number one things I tell my students is to show your process and your research and things like that, or at least explain it. Because it's, it's one thing to see the final image, but it's another thing to see that you had to go through this iterative process in order to get to that stage. And it's always really exciting to see how different artists can uh, can create something out of nothing. Yeah, and then you see how the design changes based on where it's at. Like this is a two-dimensional image. And I really like the way the hair sort of curls in a different space compared to here where the hair feels more like it has gravity. And over here, it's sort of swirling around a little bit more dynamically. And we have a close up here as well. And then Amber also did an animation, isn't that cool? Oh, that's so fun. This looks like it belongs in like a Charlie Brown Christmas nightmare or something, it's great. It does, and I love- Halloween nightmare, Halloween nightmare is what I would say, sorry. <laughs> The textures are so cool, like the splattered green and then the chunky black lines, really, really fun. And so here is the 1950s pumpkin housewife that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> this is just priceless. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. These are so funny. And then Amber also did these bottles that have three-dimensional gourds and vegetables around them. I mean, isn't the range extraordinary? This is phenomenal. I mean, there, you have animation, you have painting on a pumpkin, and you have this, I guess, sculpture or sculptural piece here. Um, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal having this type of range. It reminds me of first semester or first year of art school where they just want you to experiment. At least that's what they did at RISD. You know, they just have you experiment with a bunch of different stuff. But uh, you would be one of those lucky students who was good at everything and probably pissed off everyone else. <laughs> yep. I don't want to be in a class with somebody like that because right. Blue says, wow, that's a lot of work. And Jane says, love the diversity of the mediums. All right. The next artist is, again, I hope I say this right, Uma Sharda. And Uma had this really cool process. So first Uma says, I love capybaras. And as a fan, draw them all the time. And so what Uma did is they took multiple images so here's some capybara colored pencil drawings. Here's all these different poses. And then cropped out the various elements in Photoshop and then arranged them into different layouts. So let's take a look. These are the individual elements, all the capybaras. There's a couple gourds, a blue pumpkin, more gourds, more pumpkins. And then, oh my gosh, isn't that amazing? Oh, this is epic. It's like it's like going through a whole photo shoot of just like little individual things and then seeing the big picture. Uh, I don't know if you ever watched the Rugrats, Clara, but they had that. Oh, yeah, I know. They always had the opening as like something really small that no one knew what it was. And it could be like the nose hair of someone who was snoring or something and just zoom out and show you. That's kind of what this was like, except it's it's much more pleasant than, than nose hairs. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> I mean, it's so cool because you have these repeated elements, but the way Uma assembled things, various pumpkins behave differently. I like how the big orange pumpkin here is way behind the capybara. Here you can barely see it. And here it's more next to the capybara. So I think, Uma, this is such a great exercise in composition. 
all that flexibility, just taking these elements and moving them around. There's a playfulness here that is, I think, on Photoshop, much easier to do than, say, cutting out pieces of paper. Isn't this just a brilliant process? Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially because you're working with the same objects. Like, it's one thing to do composition studies and have completely random things. But to take the same type of object, the pumpkin and the copybara, copybara, and, you know, change that, turn it, you know, position it differently, change the height and the positioning of the camera, all that stuff, it really starts to stretch your compositional muscles. Amanda points out either these are giant pumpkins or tiny copy baras. Who knows which one that is? And Blue thinks that they're posing sexy with the pumpkins. That's one way to look at it. And Lionel says the copy baras are seriously cute. Such playful drawings, Uma. These are just wonderful. All right. The next artist is Amy Harrington. And Amy chose a jack-o'-lantern because they love autumn and Halloween. And Amy explains we had to say goodbye to our elderly kitty due to a liver failure a few days prior. And the jack-o'-lantern brings to mind, I don't know how to say this correctly, but Samhain tradition, the lore of the veil between the worlds, the loss of those that go before us and the memories that bind us together. So th this is such a different interpretation of a jack-o'-lantern because I think we have very strong associations with what jack-o'-lanterns are for, but th this is so bright and luminous, but it's also a little eerie. Yeah, well, um, I, I really like that uh, this artist took the original inspiration for Halloween. Um, and oh, the word was Sawin, by the way. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, that, that's I didn't know either until you know a little, little while ago. But but yeah, the, the origins of what Halloween represents and and all those things can really play a part into the pieces we make now. And actually, that's part of what research is for going back in the past and seeing what could be done and learning the origin and you know how do you apply that to your piece and there is that eeriness that you're talking about especially with the darker values and the kind of misty elements in the background um that subtle shine that you're getting from the floor uh or the bounce light from the jack lantern in the floor and everything it's, it's looking really really great oh and the pastel technique is so luscious i mean i'm noticing things like back here where it's softer strokes they a little bit more smeary looking but look at these beautiful blue strokes mm -hmm. on top of that super saturated orange i mean in theory you would think that's not going to help to put blue right on top of orange but then amy also does the same thing on this side so this is also blue on orange but it's a much darker more ultramarine blue mm -hmm. and then isn't this beautiful the way things just spill out of the mouth yeah it just feels like they're like it, there's fire inside and it's just kind of yeah. oozing out it's really really uh got that creepy factor uh the lighting itself is beautiful and those things that you pointed out with the the ambient light from the blue uh coming onto the pumpkin or the jack lantern is making it feel very volumetric and solid Karasu says, love the backstory. The piece has excellent composition too. And 7A notes that the light invokes that otherworldly feel for sure is beautiful. And Paula says, wow, what a mesmerizing rendition. Okay, the next artist we're gonna look at is Sherry Wagner, who also did multiple pieces. You guys are like so productive. This is like way more work than I've done in the past month. So Sherry says, whenever I'm having a little art crisis, art dares easily get me out of it. And so Sherry usually uses watercolor, but chose to do four pieces. So did oil, polymer clay, and charcoal. And the pumpkin was the main focus. So let's take a look at Sherry's pieces, the charcoal piece. What do you think? I wish I could get my charcoal to look like this when I was a student. Um, <laughs> maybe, I would, maybe I would have enjoyed it more. Um, no, but this looks great. I love the textures on the bottom of the pumpkin too, like those kind of it looked like hairs on the bottom of it and kind of those mysterious dark objects. Something about that feels so real and tactile to me. I absolutely love it. And uh, I also really like the background texture, how you got that to kind of fade, uh, fade into the darkness, into the abyss, if you will. Love that kind of stuff. And then this is such a beautiful painting. I mean, the figure has this wonderful regal quality, but then, oh my God, the texture is incredible everywhere in the headdress in the bunch of leaves and wheat 
the pumpkin, I mean, really stunning technique and beautifully told story. I think it's hard to do images like this without them being really cliche because, I mean, we've seen a million, oh, Mother Nature, Fall Harvest, Demeter, <laughs> Greek mythology type of thing, but I don't usually see such a textured portrayal. Usually it's, it's a lot more sort of sleek and pretty looking, and I just appreciate your painting technique so much. And then what do you think of this 3D piece? Oh, that this is really fun too. I love the 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 quality that you have on. I guess the the scarecrow's uh, uh, vest or shirt. Uh, I don't know what that's made of. But I'm so curious to find out. Um, and just the little kid looking up. Like, there's a true story here uh, that I really really appreciate. Iron Earth says lovely. Johanna says, "Oh my God, these are so gorgeous." Amanda says, "Sherry, you need to calm down. These are beautiful." I mean, I cannot believe the amount of work that people will sometimes do for the art dare. And clearly it got you out of your art block, Sherry, because we can see it in your productivity. Here's another one. This is some watercolor. And it's interesting. I can see some of the correlations in Sherry's painting technique compared to the one with the figure. But it also is very much its own language of watercolor. So I think that was beautifully done. All right, guess what? Johanna, who is here live with us in the chat, this is Johanna's gourds. And Johanna explains, I've been using art dares to experiment more with 3D work. And get this, so Johanna used aluminum foil inside an air dry clay sculpture that would change the process. And it ended up sped up the drying time. And Johanna used hot glue painted them with a variety of acrylic mediums, a splash of alcohol ink. I mean, can you believe all the supplies that went into this? I, I think I missed most of that list because I just hopped in from being cut off the air dab, sorry. Um, what, what were all the supplies? It's like hot glue and mediums and aluminum foil. And it's like, you can't even tell. Oh, dang. Yeah, that sounds like half a grocery list right there. That's amazing. Um, I, I don't I, I don't think I would be able to figure out what to do with all that stuff. That's probably why I just stick to pencil and paper and just keep it simple for myself. Um, but I've always admired artists who are able to take multiple things, especially things that don't even seem to correlate all the time, and make something beautiful out of it. And a lot of the stuff is not easy. Aluminum foil, air dry clay. A lot of the times there's just so much troubleshooting to make sure things are actually going to work out. I mean, you can even see here, there's these green pipe cleaners and they're just such fun, quirky objects. I mean, the hot glue is so weird. It's like, why is it this strange, slightly translucent peach color? I mean, they look like gourds, but they're, there's something not quite, I guess, accurate about them that keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I guess that's the unknown aspect of things we really like. Like I noticed when it comes to things we're afraid of or things we're concerned about, it's usually the things that are somewhat familiar, but also somewhat distant and different and unique. And uh, I think that element is playing a big role here. Yeah, Manette says fun experimentation. Daniel says, wow. And Amanda says, you used actual gourds. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Next artist is Amber. And let's take a look at Amber's statement. This is Amber's first art dare. And Amber says, as a visually impaired artist, I thought I might represent a different perspective. And so Amber does found object wire to symbolize the creation of new out of old and discarded. So for example, in the fall, fungi are collected, inspiration from the large sculpture. There's a crow sculpture, still life with bones, plastic wire, bicycle, I mean, there's so many <laughs> different supplies. I mean, people really got ambitious with this. And this really is more of an outdoor installation instead of something that you would say, hang up in a gallery. What do you think? Yeah, I really like the that approach with, like you said, it being more like an installation that's outdoors. Uh, I think it creates I'll say different restrictions. I think you have a lot more freedom to use objects from nature and make it feel like a part of the environment, but there's also limitations that come with that because you can't be as controlled maybe, but that's part of, I think the beauty 
and creating something like that is because you just let nature take its course. What I really like about this piece, The Crow, is that it so perfectly melds itself into the environment. Because a lot of the times I'll see artwork, public sculpture or whatever, and maybe it's near some trees or anything. And it's like, it just does not fit. It's like the sculpture has no awareness of what's around it. And I mean, I'm even looking at, you've got the black bold, I think that's the uh, bicycle tires. And then the way you've got this almost foundation of bones, but then all these marks coming out the back with the wheat. I mean, it's so brilliant, the mixed media that's happening. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so much fun. Look at the sunglasses on this. This is incredible. I love that. It's so cool. And it's like that is so out of nowhere because the rest of the sculpture is very gestural and it almost feels painterly in a way. And then there's this little piece of humor, Amber, that you put into the piece. And then even the color. I mean, isn't it smart? There's that little patch of red and yellow. Oh, yeah, definitely. Just those little color accents always make a huge difference when it comes to uh, creating any piece of artwork and especially something like this. Those colors will really pop out against the nature and the green of everything else. And then look at this piece. This is a close up. You can see there's some of the wire. And then I, I think this is yarn or something. I think Amber was here earlier in the chat, but this one's so unusual because it's white. It's so different than the colors around it. But it's like, I keep traveling throughout this whole thing. I mean, it, it's so compelling. Yeah, it's like a big web, which I, I really like that. It's it's something that I can't really predict the shape, but it's also something that it feels rather simple, like on the first glance. But as I go into it, I'm like, oh, there's things that are going in and out and up and down, left and right and turning around. And so it's really, really fun like in that way. And I would also say, Amber, that your sculptures are just really, really rich. I mean, maybe it's just I'm getting sick of all that modernist, like, oh, there's a triangle. Oh, it's in the city. Like, oh, yay. Like, this is so organic. And the work has such a mythological feel to it. I mean, maybe it's the bones that are making me think that. But even if I don't know the stories that inspired you, I get the feeling that there's an origin story somewhere because it does have that mythical look to it. Oh, good. Amber is here live with us in the chat. Fantastic. I'm so glad you could join us. All right, everybody, we have some prizes to give out. The honorable mention goes to Amber Vizcara for the pumpkin and the animation and the 50s pumpkin housewife. Congratulations on that. And the prize winner is Amber. I don't know how to say your name. D. Gerlando. <laughs> Sorry if I said That's it wrong. Awesome. But we, we were just so blown away by the work that you did. I think it's very engaging and I think keeps us thinking in terms of where it could possibly go. By the way, everybody, if you have not contributed to our fall raffle, I highly recommend you help us make sure that our content always stays free. We have no paywalls. And so you can access all of it for free. And we do that because we want to help people who ordinarily wouldn't be able to take an art class. But guess what? There's a lot of bills when it comes to running this platform. And so we need your help. And also we have so many cool prizes. You can win a bread fairy print. And this is a cool prize. Mia will draw your cartoon. And that is for people who pledge $50 or more. So get in there. It ends Saturday, December 9th, because our stupid Instagram is still hacked. So we extended the raffle. And so I hope you guys can get in something by then. Or if you give us a super chat or a super sticker during this live stream, that counts as well. Let's talk about the December art dare. Visual map of your brain create a visualization of what you think is going on in your brain. So what is going on in your brain, Jordan? Stress, pure stress. <laughs> <laughs> but is it spastic stress or is it like a, a slow burn? <laughs> it's like a slow burn. It's like uh, it's like waiting for an oven to preheat. <laughs> it's just, 
It's just like the heat turned up little by little by little by little to the point where it's like, okay, clearly something else needs to happen because it's just too much. Now, <laughs> now we're going to show you some brain pictures for inspiration, but honestly, you don't have to have a brain image in your artwork. This is a visual map. Ultimately, that is the visual that you guys want to work with. For me, I, I feel like my brain is a really chaotic series of ping pong games. It's like if there were 50 people and everybody was playing ping pong and there were like 500 ping pongs and they're all going, like that's totally my mind. I can see that. I can see that. I think for me, I think mine is like, a mountain and all this stuff at the bottom is the stuff I don't want to do. And then shadow boxes is at the top. <laughs> just yeah, like, yeah. Just like, I'm <laughs> I go to line. Please, please let me just do this more. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us in the chat, what do you think if you were to visualize just some basic ideas, what's happening in your brain? Because the way I think about things, I sort of dart from thing to thing. I do have moments of hyper focus. And usually that's when I'm painting but even painting i'm like oh i gotta fix this oh, wait what about the eye wait you didn't work on it <laughs> it's just like really really chaotic so i'd love to hear and you don't have to be specific you could just say yeah my brain is chaotic or oh my brain is having a margarita sipping on the beach whatever <laughs> you want it to be so here are a bunch of artists this is contemporary artist lisa nilsen and can you believe this is paper it's a particular technique called quilling. And basically what you take is all these sheets of paper and you just wrap them around and around and then you put them flat. And I, I just am like, how does somebody do this? This just blows my mind. So she has a lot of images of different parts of the human body. You can see these cross sections. And so again, you don't have to have a brain image, but Aren't the shapes really cool? Yeah, I th I think this loosely reminds me of a brain, but it's not like the like the icon that you had uh, showing what a brain looks like. And I I think it's great that uh, we're pushing people to even jump outside of that because we also want you guys to push your limits. We don't want to see like an exact brain or you know make it and make it cliche. Jump outside of the box that um, that that, is, that any sort of preconceived notion of what this idea means to you is. Um, I would love to see what you guys come up with with that. It's so open-ended. I mean, any image you can conceive of will count for this. I mean, I just love these wonky medieval, like, here's what's in your brain. It's just like a really wonky looking. And this is actually a scientifically accurate crocheted brain by Dr. Karen Norberg. And it's actually on display at the Boston Museum of Science. I mean, isn't this hilarious? That's so cool. I would love to see that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, let's hear what's happening in people's heads. Carolyn says, mine's a hamster wheel, constantly running. 7A says, scary carnival ride. 10K says, monkey banging pots and pans together. And that's literally it. <laughs> Cedric says, wires and tissue. Anna says, my brain feels like it's going in between creative activity to self-hating thoughts. And this is a good question from Karasu, who says, how can I represent my mental illness in a way that won't trigger people? Any ideas, Jordan? I mean, you, that's a tough one. I mean, the, for me, if it's something that I personally deal with, then, I'll, then I almost have permission to be able to say what it is that I feel or am experiencing. Um, Cause it'd be one thing if you were, you know, talking about a group of people that maybe you didn't have personal experience with dealing with certain things, but it's another thing to experience that yourself. And so uh, I don't know how to not trigger people necessarily. Uh, yeah. I try not to worry about it because it's, this is something that I grew up with as a phrase. I try to live by it, but what other people think about me is none of my business. And yeah. um, you know, it helps me. Don't always live by it, but it helps me when I when I get into a rut personally. Karasu, typically what is helpful is if you post the image anywhere, you just write in the capture trigger warning mental illness. And that usually is a good heads up for people. So they can choose to say, oh no, I don't want to look at this because that's triggering to me. And I know in our Discord, if you share there, 
you can put a spoiler over the image. So that way you say in the text caption, trigger warning, mental illness, and then people can choose to click on the image or not. So it's a really excellent question. There's not a particular correct answer to that, but we can certainly help you more in the Discord. So really good question from Amber, who says, does it have to be a 2D piece? Nope. We love it. As you can see, everybody did so many different media. So map, we're using that word, but really you can portray that as anything. And Parvi says, my brain has walls everywhere. Really? I don't think mine has any walls. Does yours? <laughs> I'm sure it does somewhere, but uh, I I would hope it doesn't have many. I'm, I'm not sure right now. Maybe, maybe, maybe I have so many walls that's not letting me think of past that and be, is able to say, I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like I should have walls, but I don't. And it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get ambitious, and many people did in October, you can draw four visual maps of your brain. Different sections, different versions. Maybe your brain is different in the morning. Maybe it's different in the evening. We have so much fun when people do that. And to be clear, this is totally optional. You can just do one piece and that's enough to technically enter the art dare. Reminder, fall raffle, everybody. Get in those donations. We need them so bad. I, I'm so proud that we've never had paywalls. We've kept it up for almost 10 years, but you guys are the ones that make it happen. Remember, Mia will draw your cartoon. You will get a red fairy print. There's so many cool things. Now in the Art Dares channel in the Discord, this is such a great place to work with other people. Jordan, isn't it great to see all the activity throughout the month? Oh yeah, I mean, everyone's in here working on their own ideas and is sharing their ideas and also critiquing and, and giving feedback to other people. So it's probably the safest and most comfortable place for you to share your work for this specific prompt. And if anyone's hesitant, his hesitating, please don't. Everyone in there is super kind and is just wanting to help you to become a better artist. And if they are, we boot them out. Really exactly. Bad. So don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> but this is also great inspiration that I know when people are in this channel, they help each other. Somebody says, I'm thinking about this. Somebody gives you a suggestion. So it's a great way to engage with everybody during the month. Now, to officially enter the Art Dare, you want to tap. Oh, shoot. You guys can't do that. Okay. I, I got to change this <laughs> because our account is dead. Oh, my gosh. This is so, oh, my God. This makes me really sad. Okay. So we are using a different account, which is Art Prof Family. So let me do that. Okay. I better change that on the website. Tag us at Art Prof Family with hashtag Art Prof Dare, because we are temporarily doing all the posts and everything over at that account. We also, if you are not on social media, we have a Google form that you can get by accessing artprof.org. You just go to Art Dares in the main menu, scroll down on the Art Dare page, and that will take you to the Google form. All raffle, donate, do it now, do it so I stop asking you to. I'm dreaming of the day. I don't have to ask you anymore. Anyway, we are doing a Discord chat right after the stream. Jordan and I will be in the post live streams channel so we can chat more. I already see so many cool ideas for this month's Art Dare. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, personal art curriculums, artist statement editing, and portfolio critiques. And you know something? These top Patreon supporters and everybody who donates to the raffle it's still the biggest chunk of our budget comes from supporters. I wish it, we had more in other places, but this is it. If we lost everybody here, we'd go under tonight. So let's not do that. Visit artprof.org. There's tons of stuff on there that's not on YouTube. The best way is to use the search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And JubJub wants you to subscribe for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.